and the different aspects of uh, the lab diagnosis which include cytochemistry immunophenotyping and other modalities to diagnose it so when we talk about the definition it's uh, the malignant clonal proliferation of white blood cell hematopoietic uh, component uh, the cell of origin of these cells is uncommitted partially committed hematopoietic stem cells as in my new case i lecture i taught you that the foremost and the first important thing for the neoplastic growth is uncontrolled un uninhibited proliferation of cells happening besides that because of this uncontrolled proliferation of cells the maturation process and the differentiation process cannot take place in a proper manner so there is a lack of differentiation and maturation and of course they have to resist their programs cell there that is why they inhibit their apoptosis to sustain the cells so in nutshell uncontrolled uninhibited proliferation of cells with lack of differentiation and maturation with reduced apoptosis is what makes an acute leukemia the complete catastrophe the etiological factors which lead to the leukemias are divided into hereditary and acquired factors in the hereditary factors we have down syndrome bloom syndrome pancreatic anemia ataxia telangiectasia and viscous alveolar syndrome to name a few out of which the three pancreatic anemia ataxia telangiectasia viscous alveolar syndrome are the ones which are due to the problem in the gene repair mechanism and in the nuclear division especially the pancreatic anemia the ataxia telangiectasia viscous alveolar syndrome thus our p53 gene mutation defect and our are leading to the acute leukemia because of p53 gene mutation the down syndrome is basically a numerical chromosomal disorder and as we know is due to the is due to the deficiency of uh, one uh, chromosome instead of having 23 pair there are only 22 pair and the deficiency of the the acquired factors which lead to the uh, etiology uh, etiological development of the uh, the acute leukemia is myelodysplastic syndrome myeloproliferative disorders and uh, among the uh, malignant disorders leading to the acute leukemia but among the uh, benign processes we have paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinemia and aplastic anemia to name a few which ultimately end up in the acute leukemia besides these uh, uh, factors the acquired and the uh, genetic causes or the hereditary causes there are few more uh, acquired causes which are radiations chemicals and the viral infections to name a few among the chemical reagents we agents we have chemotherapeutic uh, agents especially in the uh, second malignancy developing in the adolescent or the childhood age group especially in the survivor of the round cell tumors or the soft tissue sarcomas in pediatric age group viral infections like epstein barr virus and htlv can lead to b cell leukemia lymphomas and uh, htlv induced t cell acute leukemia when we talk about the pathogenesis there are two types of mutations which are classified as class 1 and the class 2 Uh, which can result in the different processes of the acute leukemia formation one which is related with the class 1 is the other mutations involving the hyperproliferation or increased proliferation of the tumor cells and they are FLT3 and BCR AVL gene associated so they are ha having a very poor prognosis the other ones are mutations which are preventing cells from maturing and the prime example of that is female rara induced acute promyelocytic leukemia 
the Brevi maturation arrest is happening. The other ones are Ranex1 and the MLL gene associated with leukemias, which have got intermediate to poor prognosis. Uh, the sub, uh, classification of leukemia is basically based on the cell of origin, myeloid or lymphoid. So it is acute myeloblastic leukemia and acute lymphoblastic le uh, leukemia. The clinical presentation of the two are in general similar. In details, separately we will be discussing them in my subsequent uh, slides. But when we talk about the uh, acute leukemias, the age is generally ranging uh, from 1 to 5 years in the pediatric age, but it is quite variable for acute myeloid leukemia and the T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which we discussed. Generally, they present with fever, fatigue, multiple recurrent infections due to the bone marrow being involved, resulting in the neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, and anemia. There could be bone pain due to the marrow expansion, so the medullary uh, spaces they become uh, thinned out, uh, they become expensile. So the, the the cortices they become thinned out and they result in the bone pain. They could be lymphadenopathy due to the direct involvement of the clonal uh, cells homing in into the lymph nodes. They could be batosplenomegaly because of the extra medullary hematopoiesis because medullary spaces being involved, or it could be because of the homing in of again the neoplastic cells in the liver and the spleen. Other solid organs could also be involved, like breast, um, you know, kidney, testis, testis, or any other organs you name it. And the soft tissues. CNS involvement could be with the medullary involvement or without uh, medullary involvement, resulting in the primary CNS looking at performance. So, uh, further in the lab diagnosis, first and the foremost is that we should have a good petal sphere with a complete blood count to look into the TLC count, whether it is high, very high, or low. Low, especially in AML M3, where the pancytopenia picture is present, or in the leukemias, where the leukemic blast cell expansion is happening only in the marrow, but in the periphery, the cells are not, not able to. Um, uh, circulate. And um, the T cell acute lymphoblastic leukemias and the Burkitt's type of lymphoma leukemias generally present with the hyperleukocytosis. Then uh, there could be associated cytopenias of variable combinations and permutations involving either three, um, all the three lineages or one or two, uh, depending on um, which lineage is paired in the bone marrow. And uh, the uh, further diagnosis is made by bone marrow examination to see how uh, much is the replacement of the marrow by these clonal cells and what kind of cytochemistry uh, is positive is studied by the cell of origin, whether it is lymphoid or myeloid. We'll discuss this in the subsequent slides. Finally, we make a diagnosis based on the immunophenotyping on uh, the uh, flows by the flow cytometry or immunohistochemistry on the uh, bone marrow biopsy slides or immunocytochemistry on the bone marrow aspirate slides. And uh, the further subtyping is done by molecular studies or cytogenetics to see if there's a numerical chromosomal disorder or a gene mutation happening at a much uh, submicroscopic loci. The differences between the different blasts is very important because this is asked as a, a question, as a short question to differentiate between the myeloblast and the lymphoblast. Uh, the myeloblasts are basically larger cell compared to the uh, lymphoblast. Lymphoblasts are 18 to 20 micron size cells. Lymphoblasts are smaller, 10 to 18 micron size. Cytoplasm is much more moderate and sometimes very abundant. Granular to granular. Finally, granular or uh, in the lymphoblast, it's always, always a granular scanned to uh, maybe moderate sometimes with uh, a granular bluish to gray cytoplasm. Fancy ratio is uh, very high in the lymphoblast because nucleus is more compared to the uh, cytoplasm, which is much scanned. Whereas in myeloblast, it is high. The nuclear chromatin is much finer and stiffer in the myeloblast and with the visibility of the nuclei which are very prominent and multiple in the myeloblast compared to lymphoblast which are inconspicuous ranging from 0 
to distinct maybe one and very rarely two or more. Chromatin is much more coarse than lymphoblast. A company sells a very important clue generally to decide whether we are dealing with a myeloid leukemia or lymphoid leukemia. The company sells a myeloblast are <clears throat> myelocytes, metamyelocytes, stem cell, and neutrophils. Lymphoblasts are generally accompanied by lymphocytes. This we can understand from an analogy when we say the man is decided by the company he keeps. So the, the blastic leukemia can be considered whether it is myeloblastic or lymphoblastic based on the accompanying cells which are in the peripheral smear or in the bone marrow by the along with the blast. Or roads are present in the myeloblast, whereas they're absent in lymphoblast. On cytochemistry, MPO, that is myeloperoxidase, Sudan Black B is uh, positive in myeloblast, especially when we talk about the M1, M2, and M3 types of blasts, which are highly specific and differentiated myeloid blastic cells, and they will show blue, black to brown positivity by MPO and the Sudan Black, uh, like, uh, you know, abundant in the uh, AML M3, M2 will show very discrete one, and M1 will show very neat uh, positivity along the uh, cytoplasmic uh, borders. Lymphoblast will always be negative for these stains, whereas they will be positive for pass as a block, magenta, pink color, positivity in the cytoplasm. There's a special stain, uh, especially for another subtype of acute myeloid leukemia, that is M4, M5, where M2 and Sudan Black B are not positive, or very faintly positive or rarely positive, because that's not purely myeloid uh, blast. It is myelomonocytic or purely monocytic. So they differentiate towards another subtype of a myeloid lineage cells, which is monocytic. So they show, they express non-specific asterases positivity. And the another subtype, which is erythroid and the megakaryoblastic, they show past positivity. Another stain which we can use is carcinoma, uh, which we can use is the load acetate asterase, which is positive in the maturing myeloid precursors, that is myelocytes, promyelocytes, and the uh, rarely promyelocytes, and basically myeloband and the other form, when we have to differentiate between the chronic myelomonocytic leukemia and acute, myelo, uh, acute monocytic leukemia, especially M5A and B, to be differentiated. So now we come on to the specific subcategory that is acute lymphoblastic leukemia. This is one of the most common pediatric malignancy comprising of 20 to 75% of all leukemias all over the world, out of which 85% of them are B acute lymphoblastic leukemias. So when we classify them as per the latest 2016 WHO classification, we call them as p lymphoblastic leukemia lymphomas, not otherwise specified, and with recurrent genetic abnormalities. When we talk about the recurrent genetic abnormalities, the one which tops the list with a poor prognosis is a BCR ABL uh, gene mutation, which is happening in the ALLs, especially in the adult type of ALLs. If not proven otherwise, it is always considered that a dire type of BALL will have BCR ABL gene mutation. But if it happens in the pediatric age group, again, it has a very bad prognosis. Then we have got some which, which have got intermediate or a good prognosis. Among the good prognosis, we can say ETV6, the next one, and hyperdiploidy. Hyperdiploidy is considered to be a better prognosis for the reason that the cells are in a mitotic phase. So the chemotherapy agents which are targeting against the neoplastic cells, they can target these cells which are dividing, and they're in the S phase. So they kill these cells very fast. Whereas when we have the hyperdiploidy, then the prognosis is not that good as it should have been. 
The WHO classification of TAN as per the 2016 classification divides them into early teen precursor lymphoblastic leukemia, that is ETPA, but it's a professional diagnosis uh, subclassification. It is yet to be st studied whether we should subdivide them, and this is by presence of CD1 age and absence of that that we'll discuss. Then uh, another provisional entity is the natural killer cell lymphoblastic leukemia, which is beyond your scope, but it has got different connotation because the subtype of the cells which are present, which are resulting in this uh, leukemia, are natural killer cells, which are CD16 and 56 positive. Now we come to the specific clinical features of ALLs especially in the, uh, you know, in the pediatric age groups when we talk about ages generally 1 to 5, but older for TLL and your BLL of the adult onset. The fever fatigue infection, as I said, is because of marrow, marrow failure or infiltration is one of the uh, very common presentation due to your normal hematopoietic cells being um, not absent or inconspicuous and the marrow is being infiltrated by the proliferation of cells. Thrombocytopenia will result in the uh, manifestation, bone pain, as I said, due to the marrow expansion, lymphadenopathy, organomic LA, solid organ involvement, sinus involvement, especially when it's a common, uh, when it is a TALL, especially with mediastinal involvement as well. So, uh, we have already discussed all these things in detail. First and foremost is CBC FPS. Then uh, we have to look for the uh, cytochemistry. We discussed that. The bone marrow examination followed by immunophenotyping on close cytometry or um, on immunocytochemistry on the bone marrow. Aspirate if the EDTM blood for the close cytometry is not available. And cytogenetics, molecular studies for further subtyping for the prognostic mission point of view. Uh, now we talk about the uh, older classification just for the, uh, you know, uh, historical uh, value or the knowledge point of view. Earlier, before the WHO classification came, the blasts were classified into L1, L2, L3 subtypes, out of which L3 was Burkitt's lymphoma-like uh, blastic population or Burkitt's lymphoma in the leukemic infiltrate, I would like to say that. And L2 was intermediate between the L1 and L3 and L1 were the smaller blasts with very high LC ratio and hardly any visible nuclei. So this is how you see the L1 and L2 blasts. Can you see hardly uh, just a small scant depression in the form of a cytoplasm here also, here also, rest all is just the nucleus. So you can now imagine how much is the high NC ratio, very high NC ratio is this one. Now compared to these blasts, this, uh, these blasts still have some amount of cytoplasm. So ranging from scant, scant to moderate amount, again little moderate amount and you can see the chromatin is still very clump, very coarsely clump chromatin and hardly any nuclei can be seen here. And this is in contrast, the work is lymphoma. The color of the cytoplasm is very blue and you have got rimming of the cytoplasm, uh, rimming of the nuclei in the cytoplasmic space, the very nuclear rimming by cytoplasmic vacuoles, which are non-coalescing, which are discrete from each other. The vesicles are very, very well defined. So this is what you see in the focus lymphoma, leukemia. Now this is a special stain called PAS stain. As I said, they, they show the uh, paradic shifts reagent positivity in the form of block positivity. This is a block which is magenta pink in color. This is the lymphoblast with PAS positivity. Now, uh, basics of immunophenotyping, I'll tell you, I'll not go into detail because it's a complete whole uh, uh, chapter. And uh, at your level, you just know, should know that B cell defining immunophenotyping markers are CD19, 79A, and cytoplasmic, uh, cytoplasmic CD79A, and or cytoplasmic uh, CD22. These are specific B cell markers. Along with these markers, we have color, which is CD10, that is common acute leukemia antigen associated with them, and PAX5 especially in the bone marrow biopsy, 
just in case we do not have access to the flow cytometry or we do not get good sample, good yield in the bone marrow aspirate in the EDTA for flow cytometry. The maturity markers are generally HRADR, CD34 and TDT, but in the beam lymphoid leukemia, we get more of the 34 and TDT, more so in the T, ALL, the TDT. So, a uh, little bit about the ontogeny based B cell ALL classification. So, that was molecular based, pathogenesis based, and now a little bit of ontogeny. This will help you to understand why it is needed because it will tell you whether the cells are very primitive, they are early precursor or they are little mature one or they are maturing ones. So we can predict the outcome of the immunophenotype on the flow cytometry and their behavior in the future. So earlier stage positive for 19, cytoplasmic 79, 22, TDT and 34. That's why in most of the flow cytometry panels of the mm -hmm. leukemia, we have got these markers. We have this, we have got this, we have got this, this and this and also CD20. And then the common ALL intermediate stage maturation, we always have this because this makes them pre-B cell uh, early pre-B cell uh, ALL and this has got a intermediate um, you know, uh, prognosis or behavior. Then we have got um, the, uh, the uh, further expression of the uh, immunoglobulins, especially cytoplasmic and surface. Cytoplasmic might appear here, especially in the pre -BLL. That is when they have moved from these two stages to this, but surface will not be there because surface is post germinal. They will be in the much mature cells and they will be present along with CD20, especially when we are talking with CD10, especially when we are talking about Burkitt's type of leukemia, where we'll have surface immunoglobulin, CD10 positive, 20 positive, 38 positive, and all the maturity markers will be absent, especially TDT and CD34. So this is the only leukemia which will have post germinal cell type of phenotype instead of early precursor B cell type of leukemic phenotype. So based on the ontogeny, or T, ALS can be classified into the pro-T, pre-T, cortical T, and laboratory T based on the pre-thymic and the post-thymic uh, maturation of the T cells as with your uh, prior knowledge of histology and uh, embryology in the first crop, you know that the T cells, after being formed in the bone marrow, immediately they are migrated to an organ called thymus, and in the thymus, they are sub uh, further developing and maturing. As for the immune profile and the development of an individual, especially in the pediatric age group, once they pass from the cortical thymus to the medulla, you know, different subsets, and in the process, they express certain antigen on the cytoplasm, in the cytoplasm and on the surface. And simultaneously, they also lose certain markers on the surfaces. So the pro P, as the name suggests, is a very early marker, will have cytoplasmic CD3, CD7, and will have absence of CD2, 1A, 34 can be present and there will be surely double negativity for 4 and 8 because the maturation has not happened for the helper T cell and the cell toxic T cell to come. The next is pre-T where these two markers will be retained. So CD3 and CD7, that is why they consider very important markers. They are throughout the T cells, so they are given the, the uh, status of uh, radiated specific markers, especially the cytoplasmic CD3 but 7 is a strong corroborative marker. Then they, uh, they, they gain CD2 positivity, they still lose all other markers. Cortical when it, these cells are presented to the corticals, uh, cortex of the thymus, they retain these two markers, these three markers, at the same time, they develop the expression of CD1A and they remain negative for 34 and at the same time, they are now post positive for both but the subset expression only happens once they pass to the medullary state. They become either 4 or 8 cell positive, 8 uh, positive, 
That means at the stage of cortical T only, one CD1A will present. That means if it's a CD1A positive um, leukemia, which is T cell type, it has to be premedullary or a cortical type, and it can have only the. Uh, this has got a very uh, bad prognosis called EGPL. Then uh, here, as the name suggests, it's a you know much more mature, much more uh, defined uh, role of the T cells, helper T cells, or the cytotoxic T cells will have all the markers except 1A and 34. As I said, 1A comes only very briefly when the cells are in the cortical spaces. So besides those critical analysis of the lab parameters, we also do uh, some biochemical parameters out of which LDH and uric acid are the most important paramount uh, importance uh, biochemical markers. Why? Because the cell turnover rate is high. So whenever the cell turnover rate is high, we know that the nucleic acid components experience at the pyrimidines, they give rise to uric acid. So this will automatically will be high. And again, the proliferation will, will lead to uh, you know, more LDH for the reason it is a kind of a vicious cycle. This high will lead to more proliferation and at the same time, good number of high count cells will die because of high cell turnover rate leading to the tumor lysis. That is, cells will undergo autolysis because of um, extensively, extremely high cells leading to the hyperviscosity, hyperuricemia, urate nephropathy and acute renal failure because of hyperviscosity, poor um, circulation and stagnation of these cells and the microcirculation at times can lead to um, uh, microthrombi because of high cell count and hyperviscosity. Retinological examination in the TALLs can, lead, uh, can give rise to metastinal mass more commonly but also can be seen in the B cell and uh, various serious cavity involvements can show the effusions, especially in the CSF, in the pleural cavity, sometimes in the peritoneal cavity as well, very rarely in the pericardium also. CNS can be involved and it is uh, classified as 1, 2 and 3 depending on number of WBCs. No, that means CNS 1. If the cells are less than 5, because the normal uh, WBC count of the CSF is 0 to 5 cells, so it is as good as normal. Whereas, if it is with less than 5, but these are all blast, then it is CNS2. If it has got more than and equal to 5 and all being blast, then it is CNS type 3 on the cytospin preparation. That is, we take CSF and we put it into the cytospin, which takes very minute amount of the cells also, and at a very high speed, yet preserving the cell morphology, will put the cells into a blotting paper, so that we get a very uh, sharp, smaller field where the blast will be concentrated, which will stain and will visualize and see if the blast are there on the so now, again, this is a very important question which we ask you. The general question which we ask you is the etopathogenesis and the genetic factors leading to the ALL. And with a special note on the prognostic factors, or you can be just ask the prognostic factors in ALL to write a brief note. So please uh, pay attention to this particular slide very well. So um, the favorable and the unfavorable factors are decided based on the basic uh, clinical features the laboratory features and of course the cytogenetics and time to remission and the very sensitive test for the uh, minimal residual disease at day 28 to 56. So we start with the WBCs count that is a white blood cell count. We say if the count is uh, uh, count is 10 to the power uh, less than 10 to the power 10 to, uh, less than 10 to 10 to the power 9 per liter. Sorry for the typing uh, error. It is 10 to the power 9 per liter. And if it is hyperlipocytosis where the count is more than 200 to 10 to the power 9 per liter, it is unfavorable. So anything which is lesser is considered to be favorable, but hyperlipocytosis definitely is an unfavorable situation. 
younger the age is considered to be unfavorable especially the infantile age or the congenital one but if it is toddler or 1 to 10 years better but if it is more as i told you earlier there are more chances of having unfavorable psychogenetic involvement especially the pca avian anemia of less than 7 is is okay but uh, uh, sorry the anemia of less than 7 is unfavorable and more than 10 is favorable platelet count of uh, less than 100000 is favorable and less than 50000 is unfavorable gender male is unfavorable female is better ethnicity blacks are unfavorable white is favorable lymph node and the other organ involvement if it is massively involved or involved moderately is unfavorable if it is completely absent is a favorable uh, outcome cns involvement is not considered to be uh, a good prognosis marker here we have got glass as well as pleocytosis here that means we have got increase in the number of cells with or without glass is considered to be a poor prognosis so um, if you have got hyperleukocytosis this kind of age bracket this kind of thrombocytopenic these features at the outset and a poor a poor cytogenetics involved at the outset one is supposed to do the cns examination and uh, the csf examination and of course it is to be repeated after the induction phase gets over then uh, the old fashion fab classification we say l2 is bad and l1 is less that is more the cytoplasm uh, it is considered to be bigger blastic cell with uh, you know a very high nc ratio at the same time more cytoplasm unfavorable l1 smaller blast very inconspicuous uh, cell is a better prognosis color positive considered as i told you in my previous slides of ontogeny it's a better prognosis compared to immature cells with surface immunoglobulin that is the burkitt's lymphoma type uh, leukemia type of uh, immunophenotyping or etpl as i told you cd1 positivity ploidy hyperdiploidy as i told you earlier is considered to be a good prognostic factor compared compared to hypodiploidy and diploidy in the form of hypodiploidy is considered unfavorable transfiguration 922 that is a bcr able as one of the worst one followed by 411 whereas um, the trisomy especially for an a10 and uh, 1221 transfigurations are better and uh, time to remission is also important that's why day 8 to day 10 uh, petrol smear uh, slides are very important if the blasts are present at day 8 that means it's a it's not a good uh, sign we have to uh, you know give the aggressive induction phase and they are present even till the day 28 definitely we have to prolong the induction and we will do the assessment of the mrd not at 28 days here if the cells are present at day 8 or 10 we will delay it here definitely more than 56 days uh, for the induction uh, phase to get over and the mrd assessment after day 56 the assessment of the mrd again depends whether we are getting 0.1 to the power minus 3 types of cells the blastic cells at day 28 to 56 depending on the types of um, you know induction regime we have followed or if it is present uh, less than uh, 0.1 to the power minus 3 that means the variable outcome is not there so with this we come to the acute myeloid leukemia since the topic is pretty fast a uh, pretty long so i have to go a little faster so here uh, we have got instead of lymphoid we have got the myeloid um, uh, cells which are undergoing chromium proliferation at the level of funny forming unit which is gemm that is erythromyelomegakaryoblast so uh, when we go back to the historical preview of the fab classification which until uh, 80s was uh, 80s or almost till uh, late 90s was doing uh, you know fantastic uh, uh, rounds of applause because everybody was following that the blast percentage to call an acute leukemia was 30% anything which was less than 30% uh, uh, you know was a gray zone 
and um, that is why the need for further progression was and the research was felt. So here we had uh, the neutrinos in a simple way, dividing uh, them into from M0 to M7, depending on the different uh, you know, stages of maturation. M0 means it's not at all uh, you know, uh, defined or it's not lineage uh, inclining, it's not showing any proper differentiation, whereas the last extreme of the uh, myeloid classification was metatheroblastic. So this one is uh, differentiated. This had um, you know, uh, proper differentiation with all rods. This was promyelocytic, this was myelomonocytic, this was monocytic or monoblastic. This was erythroblastic, this was medicated plastic. And the commonest subtype in India was and is AMLM2, which is myeloid leukemia with differentiation. By differentiation, we mean that the cells beside the blast are almost up to their stage of neutrophils and they are less than or uh, more than or equal to 10%. So WHO classification of 2016 just does not does the classification which is which was so crude and rudimentary at that point of time because of lack of research and uh, the resources in most of the part of the world, whereas this one takes up so many things into account, uh, especially the immunophenotyping uh, availability in the most of the parts of the world the genetic and the uh, uh, the uh, counseling and the studies and the molecular studies, all these things have made and uh, basically the need for all this was felt when we did the triaging of the, uh, the treatment or the prognostication of the patients that why one type of or subtype of AML is not behaving in a similar manner in different parts of the world or within the same part of the world and why there's so much of heterogeneity. When this heterogeneity was, uh, you know, addressed, then so many factors came along. Then the need of a new classification was felt, which came along in 2002 as a full first time published WHO classification of all the hematopoietic uh, leukemias, lymphomas or the malignancies which has been subsequently revised and the latest one is WHO classification 2016. And now the blood uh, blast cell count has been dropped from 30 to 20 percent, not in 16, it was dropped in 2002 itself when the first classification came. The reason being was that what to do with the cases who have got 20 to 29 percent of blast and just falling short of 30%. And over the time, it was felt and seen and observed that the patients who have got 20 to 29% of the blast, they behave equally bad. That is why this bar of 30% was lowered down to 20% uh, blast percentage count. Even now, I'll not go into the detail of it, even the 20% of the blast uh, you know, population is not considered as a diagnostic criteria in many of the leukemias, but that's beyond your scope, so I'll not go into the details of it. So, based on the classification we have got, AML with recurrent genetic abnormalities, AML with myelodysphasia and changes, therapy-related AML, that means a person who has already received some chemotherapy, as I told you, as a second survivor, as a survivor with second malignancies, they uh, they can have acute myeloid leukemia, especially around cell tumors, rhabdomyosarcoma treated or osteosarcoma treated cases. They very, very commonly develop acute leukemias or Hodgkin's lymphomas or NHL, to name a few. Then uh, we have the NEAT uh, category, which is called AML, not otherwise specified. That means these three, uh, you know, uh, the categories are not there. They do not have any predisposing factors, but they are de novo acute myeloid leukemias with no predefined genetic abnormalities here or here. Then we have a separate entity called myeloid sarcoma. That means the acute leukemias, as I told you, they can involve any part of the body, any organ or soft tissue. So here they are coming in the form of a soft tissue sarcoma, 
in the soft tissue or and involving the skin or the lymph node but bone marrow space is completely free of disease so to call the myeloid sarcoma myeloid sarcoma one has to rule out involvement of the bone marrow or peripheral blood at all point of time then we have uh, myeloid proliferation or the amls related to down syndrome and the the one which tops the list is aml m7 acute myelogenic leukemia um, uh, megacardioblastic leukemia which is aml m7 but others can also be really involved then we have very rare leukemia which is called blastic calcitoid dendritic cell neoplasm which is very poor in prognosis which is positive for cd123 56 and 34 as these are uh, stem cell dendritic cell markers to present with and uh, these patients can present with marrow as well as lymph node and or skin involvement or they can just present with the skin involvement in the due course of time these cells can proliferate in the other species where the dendritic stem cells are present then we have acute leukemia of ambiguous period this is a leukemia which is coming up and picking up the pace in the past few years earlier since it was a very difficult leukemia to diagnose uh, you know people were not able to pick up because the flow cytometry was not available so they were either dumped into the lymphoid type or myeloid type or unclassified type but now with the flow cytometry being there and we have got support of the cytogenetics we pick up these leukemias very commonly so uh, to talk little more about the aml with recurrent genetic abnormalities these are uh, acute leukemias as i said without regard to blast percentage but since you are under that studies it's wise for you to write 20% but you can write even the lesser percentage of the blast count if otherwise supported can be aml but in the recurrent uh, recurrent genetic abnormalities you have to have a documented proof of the following genetic abnormalities before you count the aml with this even with the lesser number of blast percentage so what we have here we have got the next one with translocation a21 this does not have a very uh, you know A good prognosis neither very bad it is intermediate to good prognosis depending upon the which low size and poor then this one is a good one which is inversion 16 if given a choice one can ask for inversion 16 or uh, pml rara gene mutation uh, you know uh, so that one can have a better prognosis so uh, these two have a good prognosis this is good to intermediate Uh, 911 is uh, with the mlll is a poor uh, you know uh, a genetic uh, mutation to one has to have and uh, this one has got various uh, partner genes involved so it's quite a promiscuous kind of um, you know gene mutation which is beyond your scope but to remember it is a poor uh, you know uh, intermediate uh, group of intermediate to poor but lesser than the bcr abl type of a genetic uh, involvement then npm1 and uh, this post mccary basic translocation 122 not a good uh, prognosis to have not a good uh, mutation to have now this is just a uh, you know subtype will go in passive will not go in detail not uh, of your uh, you know among your school because the question can come as define the acute myeloid leukemia sub classify them and uh, write the uh, morphological lab, uh, and the etiological features and the lab diagnosis when it's a full question but the smaller part of it could be etiopathogenesis and the morphological features of acute myeloid leukemia with special emphasis on the lab diagnosis so there are two different combinations which can be asked when the sub classification comes you can just mention this type of sub type but generally we ask about the aml and os type which is important for you so now therapy related i told you earlier it could be a chelating agent or they will two for isomerase two inhibitor some can be uh, to lymphoid as i told you hodgkin's lymphoma lymphomas now this is the main uh, leukemia which you should be knowing that is the aml anos that is the neat type that is not otherwise specified 
This is minimally differentiated, as I said, M0, where you will be having a barely perceptible idea that this was, this is AML or this could be AML only when the cytochemistry is performed. Because what you see is just the blast, everywhere blast, there is no differentiation happening. So this will have AML, which is again without maturation, but the ore rods will be there. Whereas here, you have ore rods and differentiation in the form of neutrophils and the maturing uh, precursors of the neutrophils, that is the band forms and the staph forms, which is more than and equal to 10%. That means the blast count will be generally less than or equal to 90%. Here, you'll have just the blast, no other cells to accompany, or maybe rarely you will have them. And there will be generally absence of all rods here. Here, the all rods will be there, but cytochemistry will show NPA positivity. So these are the three. This is the one which is very difficult to differentiate morphologically. They can be confused with the lymphoblastic uh, leukemia. So we have to pay attention to the cytoplasm uh, and the the uh, the uh, maturation pattern of the chromatin of the blast and the presence or absence of the uh, nucleolite. But the classical lymphoblast and mammoblast, when we compare, we compare with the M1 or M2 type of subtype, not with the M0, because it's it's a difficult leukemia to pick up just based on the morphology. Then this one, as I said, is myelomonocytic leukemia. Here we have got the differentiation of the cells in the monocytic population. Can you see when you saw the lymphoblastic leukemia, isn't it? looking like a lymphoplastic only, hardly any cytoplasm, patient color. At the same time, uh, you know, you do not see uh, blast or nucleolite, but yes, you can see occasional one. With of waste, this is a myelomonocytic where there is a nuclear indentation. Cytoplasm is more uh, abundant, grayish in color. Mm -hmm. This is a mono, uh, myelomonocytic. You have got myeloblast and monocytic cells with nuclear lobulation and indentation. Now, this is M3 versus M1. So, what you have, you have got the apple core appearance of the myelomonocytic uh, leukemia. This is apple core appearance. This is the bilobe nucleus. This is again uh, the bilobe appearance. And you have got polarization of the nuclei. Granules, that is in the cytoplasm, you have got lots of granules here. And this is M1 type of AML where the blasts are seen with the very thin, slender R rods, and you have got prominent nuclear line. Right, so now we come back to the diagnosis. So, so we saw AML M0, 1, 2, and 3, and 4. Now we come to the uh, M5 and M5B, the, as the name suggests, it's a monoblastic. That is, the M5 wave will show nearly 80% and above cells which are monoblastic, that is blastics looking mono cell, uh, monocytoid cells, means they will look just short of plastic, that is perfectly round nucleus, very prominent nuclei, and uh, maybe uh, flowy cytoplasm um, in the, if the monocytic differentiation is happening, but very discrete cytoplasmic border when it's a purely monoblastic ones. And uh, pure erythroid leukemia, when it is showing more than 80% of early erythroid precursors, and majority of them, at least more than 30% of them, are pro erythroblasts, which are giant erythroid precursors, prominent nuclear life, very deep blue cytoplasm, and also they have got nuclear dyspoiesis in the form of binucleation, multinucleation, cytoplasmic vacuoles. Then we have got acute metacardiogastric leukemia. This is M7. This will show cytoplasmic blebbing, cytoplasmic fragmentation, dyspoietic cells might also, uh, you know, pinch off the platelets and the precursors from your cytoplasmic fragments as the part of process of maturation. We can also we also have acute basophilic leukemia, very rare in my entire career. I have seen only one case of ABL, and uh, it's it's very difficult to pick up because the basophilic leukemia will not have mature basophils, but they will show very scant amount of the uh, basophilic granule, which is the hallmark of the cells to be picked up in a normal morphology. As such, basophils not not only come uh, normally. 
they are hardly there in the general population and that too when they come up in the living with form they are difficult to be differentiated unless we have the markers to pick, to pick them up or electron microscopy because that is the diagnostic criteria to call ABM as an acute base of epithelia. Then we have acute band myelosis with myelofibrosis. This is a condition where even the 20% blast percentage is not needed because it is first acute and myelofibrosis happening. Remember, myelofibrosis takes years and months to develop, uh, you know, fibrosis. Whereas here, it's an acute onset myelofibrosis with band myelosis. So, what you have, you have complete infiltration of the marrow by blastic cells and, and or uh, blastic cells along with myelofibrosis. So, there is another term, as I said, myeloid sarcoma. The first and the foremost condition is it has to be extramedullary tumor. That means no marrow involvement. And it is also called pleroma. Why? Because in the lighter skin, it appears as green, whereas in our complexion, brown complexion or the dark complexion, it, it might not come up that way. It will be uh, definitely different from the normal appearance of the skin. It will be brown to bluish to greenish hue, depending on the shade of the skin. It will be chloroma because it's colored uh, tumor or the colored oma means, uh, you know, swelling, which is colored. And they will be positive for the NPO and or um, CAE, that's fluoracetate asterase or leather stain. They can proceed AML or can occur at the diagnosis just at the outset of it. But generally they proceed because to call them a sarcoma, the marrow has to be free at that point of time. So subsequently, you know, uh, the criteria to fill up the uh, diagnosis as AML might not be there in the marrow most of the time. So maybe there will be few uh, blast cells there or can be completely free. It can come only in the skin on the soft tissue. They can also come up as CML blast crisis or blastic transformation of the MDS, especially in the soft tissue or in the skin. Or they can come up as extramedullary relapse in a treated old or the known case of AML with no involvement of marrow or blood. So effacement of a tissue architecture, if it's a skin, complete dermal involvement or epidermodermal involvement, destruction of the, uh, the uh, appendages of the skin has to be established. And uh, if it is in the orbit or in the eye, it will destroy the orbit or the eye. If it's in the lymph node, complete architectural disarray will be there. And um, they will be positive, as I said, uh, said for these particular stains. Now, this is another one which I would just go in passive. One is the TAMP. This is the transit abnormal myelopoiesis or myeloid leukemia associated with Down syndrome. Both these conditions are in infantile situation or a neonatal or the congenital situation. The child might be born with these abnormalities. And for the uh, TAMP, something is important that these are the cells, these are the cases where the blast cells are more in the periphery compared to the, um, the bone marrow. That is, they come in the circulation. That is, when they're transient, you'll have hyperlipocytosis, you'll have immature cells in the blood, plus more compared to the marrow, and they will completely be subsided as the time passes. The child becomes more, uh, you know, um, uh, maturer or ages, and they're associated with the GATA gene mutation. Whereas, AMLs with the Down syndrome generally have poor prognosis, especially in seven. This will not go in detail. As I said, this is a very poor prognosis. And the involvements I told you, immunophenotyping I told you, 56 positive, 34 positive, 123 positive. Skin can is involved many times, solitary, multiple, only skin. Skin will be marrow with the lymph nodes because dendritic cells are present in these different sites. Now we come to this acute leukemia of ambiguous lineage. This is a very difficult part of the uh, phenotyping because without phenotyping on flow cytometry and cytogenetics, this diagnosis cannot be made. 
these are basically acute uh, leaking of undifferentiated morphology that means they do not show any morphological lineage specific markers they are neither myeloid they are neither lymphoid and they show maybe some immaturity markers so that is they are leukemia cells are looking similar on the morphology they are not looking normal there is no maturation pattern yet they do not show you any discrete lineage specific markers we call them as acute undifferentiated leukemia but the caveat to the diagnosis is that we should have a complete elaborate panel to call this as this because it is the diagnosis of exclusion and the complete set of the panel of cytogenetic abnormalities the common one has to be done before we label this then we have another one which is called mixed phenotype acute leukemia which is mpar which has got various combinations and permutations as the name suggests they do not confer to a single type of phenotype on immunophenotyping or on flow cytometry because they have got the combinations which could be b and myeloid which is the most common followed by b and t which is little lesser then the t myeloid much lesser and very rare which is tri lineage that is tri phenotypic which is b t and myeloid so how do we say that this is b and myeloid as i said for b it has to be 19 and cytoplasmic 79 a positive strong two markers if one of them is weaker then it is three markers including 22 cytoplasmic or 20 preferably cd uh, 22 cytoplasmic For myeloid MPO is the most important really specific marker, so cytoplasmic MPO has to be positive. If it's weaker than other two associated, like one of the uh, you know 13, 33, and or neurocytic markers, which are uh, the uh, CD16 and 64 positive. Then we have got B and T. We have already told you for T we have to have cytoplasmic CD3 positivity, and um, with and uh, you know. Of course, if we have got other markers like CD7 and CD2, very good. But cytoplasmic CD3 is a must to call T, and uh, the combinations you can put up the way I told you earlier. So how they present the ALLs? They are not different from the AMLs, but we know that the ALLs are generally in the um, uh, in the uh, basically uh, sorry AMLs are generally in the adults. and uh, they could be in the pediatric populations less than 10 years and uh, they generally present like ALL only so again they can have marrow infiltration predator features like fatigue fever uh, infections anemia um, you know pallor or organomegaly or they can come up as leukemia cutis that is only skin involvement uh, leukemia cutis is different from the chloroma because chloroma will have colored growth Here the skin is diffusely infiltrated, and maybe macular papillary rashes. When we do the FNAC or um, do the biopsy, we'll find this is there silently. They could have nodular villaceous lesions, as I said, macular papillary, or maybe sometimes nodular, and they can be the precedence of the AML. And most likely in the M4 and M5, the soft tissue infiltration is there because of a uh, um, because their um, the affinity for the soft tissue in the gum as the home in there because of certain markers which have been presented in especially in MG2 then cs involvement is especially seen with the unfavorable uh, uh, prognosis hyperleukocytosis and as i said m4 m5 which due to the marker called ng2 which has the propensity for the cns and the gum infiltration that is they they have got uh, the tendency to infiltrate out of the medullary spaces and thus can involve these two side primarily or even before the marrow involvement lab diagnosis is more or less same we have discussed Only thing is they've got all rods, blast percentage, special stains. We have discussed. Uh, we have seen this also. M5, M6, M7. I said LDH uric acid. Coagulation profile needs to be discussed here because compared to ALL, uh, acute myeloid leukemia because of the granular uh, portion uh, in the cytoplasm, especially in the acute myeloid leukemia of M3, M3B type. Where uh, the granules which are present in the AML cells 
they have got the um, coagulopathy uh, inducing substances in them and the patient can go into DSC. So this is uh, the classical anal slide which we show you very prominent nuclei at the edge of the nucleus and thin slender beautiful long or rods and this is a classical feature you see in M1 and this is a thicker stubby um, you know, or rod with multiple prominent nuclei almost four here and one and two and a very small one here this is M2 uh, type of or rod. Okay, so this is M1, thin, slender, longer one, and this is M2, which is thicker one. Right, this is the positivity of the MPO. Right, you can see the cytoplasmic granules which are coming down black here. So, down black B also is this, but depending on the counter stain, if the counter stain is dark, this will be brown in the MPO. So, down black B is as the name suggests, is always black in color. Then this is the pass positivity again in the myeloid leukemia, especially in the erythroblast and megakaryoblast, along with the uh, lymphoblast. Lymphoblast, I have already shown in the previous slide that it was a block positivity. Here it is a granular positivity, and uh, you will see that in the M6 and M7. Now, this is a case, just a case which I wanted to discuss so that you understand whatever I taught you. This is a case which is showing blast in the peripheral sphere. You can see there's nothing, no normal cell which is seen, just the large cells and they have got abundant grayish flowy cytoplasm. The cell borders are not very well defined except in this cell. The cell borders are defined, so probably this is a monoblastic cell. The rest are showing indentation of the nucleus, flowy cytoplasm, then moderate to abundant amount of cytoplasm, prominent nuclei in many, and indentation is seen. Here also, some sort of indentation and cupping is seen. So this is M4 versus M5. Uh, at, your, at this point of uh, time, I will not go into the detail of this because M5 will show you just these type of cells. M4 can show you the mixture. So when we do the differentiation, uh, differential count, if it is more than or equal to these type of cells of 80%, M5A, and you have the mixture of myeloblasts like these and monocytoid cells, which are less than 80%, um, uh, which are 80% of them, the, com uh, the combined together, then we call this as M4, right? So what we do, we do the special stain called NSC because these cells will not be MPO positive. MPO is, as I told you, is positive only M1, M2, M3, very strong. M0 can show, right? But M4 and M5 will not show you this. Very rarely they can be positive, but they are most strongly positive for the NSC, which is the non-specific asterase, which is positive here which gives the reddish brown positivity in these cells and the internal control is platelets, megakaryocytes in the bone marrow and the homocytic cells. So what you get, uh, the uh, you can see this is a this is the cytogenetic basic G bending pattern of a cytogenetic. You can see the numeric representation of the chromosome when we count from year 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So, what do you see? There is trisomy. You can see at the position A, there are three chromosomes. This is 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 2, and 3. So, when you have 9, 22, you will start from year and year, you will see changes of translocation. Right? If you see about the 16 chromosome inversion, the part of this chromosome will come here and the the topography of the chromosome will be changed. They will become bulbous here compared to being at the blau, uh, uh, down, uh, beneath the central mirror. Here you have a central mirror and this will become opposite. So this is inversion 16 because it's being inverted. So these are common ones which you should pay attention to. 922 trisomies, 821 that is this chromosome coming on to the uh, chromosome number 20. So these are the ones which we see and 1517 of course. So 1517 is this one and this one they translate. It. Okay, now this is the flow cytometry. This is actually to, uh, you know put into together. I have done this. You will not be able to see properly but basically what we do that 
In this, we uh, show that they are myeloid at the same time. Bonus 1664, they will express and they will express myeloid markers with the maturity, which is 64, right? So, uh, they can show the HLADR positivity and uh, they will uh, have the uh, monocytic markers. Now, these are some pictures which are for the active promyelocytic leukemia because it's important. And uh, this is the hyper uh, uh, granular variant which is showing the faggot cells that is the, uh, you know, stuffing of the cytoplasm with the all rods. And this is the hyper granular variant where you can barely see a uh, you know, or rot and hardly uh, much of the granules. And this is M6, as I told you, it dispoises in the erythroid uh, precursors. It's a, it's a dyspoietic erythroblast with four separated nuclear lobes, abundant cytoplasm, deep blue cytoplasm. These are erythroblasts, deep blue cytoplasm, very big cells. And uh, you can't see anything. There's a binuclear dividing cell, which is again dyspoietic. And you can see hardly any cell except the erythroid. So obviously, when we do the differential, more than 80% cell will be erythroid. It is erythroblastic leukemia. And this is M7, which is showing cytoplasmic blebbing. And you can see the platelets are pinching off. And we do the staining. They will come positive for CD61, 41. And they will be positive for pass here and this will also be pass positive here. Sometimes we see the granule, uh, the vacuoles which are coalescing. In contrast to Broca's lymphoma, they are non coalescing and they will be pass positive. And uh, the immunophenotyping for M6 is glycophorin CD71 and 235A. So this is just a chart to show you just now I told you. 71 and glycoprotein positivity only in M6, only and only in the M6, 41 and 61 only and only in M7 and uh, for M0 we have got 34 in HLADR very commonly, very very commonly, so they will be positive in M0, M1 they could be, but the other thing is they will be MPO positive so what you will see in the MPO uh, cytoplasmic markers are not put up, but that is there. So myeloid, we have 13, 33, and 15. But uh, monocytic, we have 14, 11, 64, and 16. So we put up these all markers uh, as an acute leukemia panel, except CD71 uh, and glycoprotein is the routine, and the morphology. We see a required uh, morphology. Otherwise, all these markers are routinely put up in the panel. So, like uh, AML, we have uh, favorable and unfavorable in the AML also. Favorable is less than 45 years, very young age and very old age in AML is unfavorable. De novo is always considered well, I told you. But if the ant antecedent, other hematological disorders are there, is bad prognosis. Infection is generally associated with the unfavorable prognosis. And prior chemotherapy is again unfavorable. So, Therapy associated, hematological disorders associated, myelodysplasia associated is all bad. Only de novo and OS is good. Hyperleukocytosis again unfavorable, less is better. The LDH has to be low or normal. If it is raised, again hyperleukocytosis associated. And extramedullary deposits are bad. CNS involvement is bad. Anything which is going beyond the medullary spaces is always bad. And cytoreduction, if it is rapid, it's good. That means cells are in the S phase. You can target them. If it is delayed, it is a bad prognosis. Or rots is always considered good. That is why N0 is considered not a very good diagnosis to have. Right. So M0, M4, M5, they have poor prognosis because they're devoid of or rods. And uh, ES2 pills uh, are considered to be a good prognosis, only exception is when we have got uh, inversion 16 associated MLM4 E0 where the prognosis is good, but otherwise they are not. This plastic MGKs obviously they are very poor in prognosis, that is why M6, M7 and M0 subtypes, they become poor prognosis markers followed by M4 and M5 because of various other reasons because they have a propensity to go to the skin extramedullary side, have CNS involvement because of NG2 and also they have got absence of all rods in them. 
then the good markers are uh, you know when the myelin markers like 34 and 30 30 14 are negative better if this is present that is un um, and uh, that is more immature it's a poor prognosis then um, if a lymphoid uh, uh, markers aberrant aberrant positivity is there it is considered a bad prognosis especially 7 and 56 and also 4 to some extent cd4 cd7 and 56 especially 4 and 56 presence means the there is a presence of stem cell precursors like the uh, dendritic cells they uh, they are also being co-expressed this is a poor prognosis then uh, translocation a21 as i told you earlier is a good prognosis and in version 16 and 15 17 we've given a choice to have a leukemia these are the favorable ones and rest all are very very poor especially complex gate type deletion type q because deletion type q said in q trisomies they considered um, you know as a marker of mds and nd associated acute myeloid leukemia or acute myeloid leukemia with nd changes so with this i end uh, my presentation if you have any queries please uh, feel free to talk and uh, just uh, you can uh, post your questions if you have understood everything please let me know which i doubt because too much into too less a time uh, there we should take these lectures in two uh, forms but because of this covid we have clubbed everything together but this lecture has got three to four questions which can come as i told you in the lecture all is the differences between the lymphoblast and myeloblast to the favorable and the unfavorable factors of AML and ALL sub classification of AML uh, NOS type with uh, WHO 2016 with cytomorphological etiopathogenesis features and the lab diagnosis ML and AL so any doubts please let me know so with this we finish the lecture of acute leukemia if everything is understood and uh, we meet again for the next lecture that is a chronic continuous have a good day bye bye